This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Seventy-five years ago today, at 8.15 in the morning, the U.S. dropped the world's first atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Destruction from the bomb was massive. Shock waves, radiation and heat rays took the lives of some 140,000 people, ultimately. Three days later, the U.S. dropped a second atomic bomb on Nagasaki, killing another 74,000 people. President Harry Truman announced the attack on Hiroshima in a nationally televised address, August 6, 1945. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. Today, 75 years later, at 8.15 this morning, a temple bell tolled in Hiroshima to commemorate the world's first nuclear attack. Tens of thousands normally gather to commemorate the bombing anniversary, but this year's ceremony at Hiroshima's Peace Memorial Park was kept small due to the coronavirus pandemic. Hiroshima Mayor Kazumi Matsui addressed a group of survivors and public officials. On August 6, 1945, a single atomic bomb destroyed Hiroshima. Rumor at the time had it that nothing will grow here for 75 years. And yet, Hiroshima recovered, becoming a symbol of peace, with many people from all over the world visiting the city. For more, we're joined by a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Hideko Tomura Snyder. She was 10 years old when the bomb was dropped. Her memoir recounting the moment is titled One Sunny Day, A Child's Memory of Hiroshima. She's a retired psychiatric social worker, founder of One Sunny Day Initiatives, a peace education organization. She's joining us from Medford, Oregon. We welcome you to Democracy Now! It's an honor to have you with us, Hideko Tamura Snyder. Can you go back 75 years ago, 8.15 in the morning, in your city of Hiroshima? Tell us where you were and what happened next. Thank you, Amy, for inviting me. Yes, I remember. Even though over 75 years, just like yesterday, I was the happy, happiest child just home from Country Haven from night before, thinking so fortunate to be home. The morning was very sunny, birds were chirping, butterflies over flowers, and I was leaning over in my own house with my back to the garden, reading a book. First at 7.30 was a warning siren, but the radio I turned on said, the plane Three planes came and turned around and went away. It's safe now. Go back to work. It was safe now. Go back to work so we could resume our daily affairs. And suddenly there was a flash in, the, in my peripheral vision. I jumped on my feet and turned around and simultaneously, practically, with the flash, came a humongous, deafening sound. So huge. I had never, ever heard. 
and went on just resounding with a huge sound. And luckily, my mother had taught me what to do if something akin to a bomb hitting our house or garden directly to try to find very sturdy furniture and place myself between, which I did. He, she said, likely, even if the house collapsed on top of us, there will be a small room left. And I, I tried to hang on, but I couldn't even squat. The shaking was so huge in whichever way, and thermal wind from the explosion was so violent. Everything was hitting me, even if I was between two sturdy furniture. So I was under the wreckage. I think it was pitch dark. I could not see anything. And I think the sound of it, I did not pass out. I wish that I did. So I remember the sensation, the color, and the smell, like yesterday. I think it went on in a pitch dark, almost 10 or 15 minutes. And when the sound subsided, I found myself under the debris. The house was well built with large pillars, so the roof did not come down flat on top of me. But I was not able to get out, and it was an effort trying to move towards where there was a light coming. And somehow, crawl to get from under the debris. And I was sure that it was one bomb hit our yard. But when we came at, it, it was a household the family of the Tamra industry, my grandfather, who had uh, passed away by that time, um, was the um, chair of a multinational corporation. And Tamra industry name, I noticed that in the map of the uh, Allied Forces, American military map, had Tamra industry clearly marked. I suppose for uh, all incendiary attacks and so forth, they would mark factories, you know, to, to aim. And so we were one of them, and our house was fairly close to it. When I came up outside, I found myself huge. Shards of glass were stuck in my foot. And I, you know, I, I was an only child, not given to efficient self-care. The smallest scar I would run to my mother, you know, help me, mother, a little bruise. So I had no idea what to do. I was just... Terribly, you know, frightened. You, you, you couldn't walk around with it. So, you know, Tamara household was filled with Tamara family, uh, extended relations. I asked an aunt, "Oh, auntie, please help me! I did th th this horrible thing on my foot." She was not able to help me. Everyone was scarred, bruised, and my father's older brother, Uncle Hisao, who took over the Tamra industry, had barely made it back 
to the house and was sitting and screaming to us, it is the end. End has come. And gashing cuts from the middle of his throat. I think he had more glass shards than everybody in the factory, the glasses when, you know, it, it was destroyed, stuck all over his body. And he was bleeding from it and bleeding all over. It, it was a, a really a very scary sight, as was when I mustered my courage. Nobody is going to help me. I am the only one who can do. And with trembling hand, washed around it, after I very slowly picked this huge glass out of my leg, realizing it's the first time I had to do something this awful and this scary, and knew, looking back on it, it was the last day of my childhood. It's a really long story. Leaving this scene by myself because the heat of radiation was so strong, you know, multiplied by it from the heat that will melt steel so much more and turn the woods on fire and turn buildings on fire and across the street went with a huge sound in a block full of flame. And I realized we're going to be surrounded and burned to death if we don't escape. And my mother's instruction was get away from under the debris, go to the river and save yourself staying by the river and escape along the river. And Hiroshima had several rivers, seven, from a major river coming in and pouring into the inland sea. So that's where I headed. The, in front of the gate were women on the ground reaching out to me and these first ladies I saw on the ground bleeding and not even sitting, crawling, were speaking in Korean that I could understand from the gesture. But I was only a child. I've never been hurt the way I was or seen anything like this, or the house come down. You know, a child has this feeling, your parents are always going to be there, and your room is going to be there, and, you know, all your books and your world. You don't picture it to change, even though we had been evacuated, and my, my mother had told me, and I know the B-2900s would go over our sky, and we were in the war. But the child, you know, can't imagine anything changing that drastic, and people dying and bleeding, and reaching, raising hands and begging, please help. And there was nothing I could do. I was needing a help myself. I don't know how much you like to know, because it's a long story about fleeing that day.
Well, uh, Miss uh, uh, Hideko Tam uh, Tamura Snyder, uh, thank you so much for that um, extremely powerful account. We wanted to know if you could say a little about what happened uh, to your mother and, and to your siblings, and also the ongoing health impacts of radiation, uh, of uh, the dropping of this uh, nuclear bomb on Hiroshima. <sighs> Okay. I never wanted to accept it, but the last she was seen was screaming as the heavy concrete, a part of the building falling on her. She was buried alive and burned alive at barely 30 years of age, a beautiful woman and very loving. I was an only child, therefore, no sibling, but I had a sibling like playmate, beloved cousin. I lived under the same cousin Hideyuki. The last he was seen. He was with over 8,000 children at ground zero, barely being able to walk, but a classmate of his uh, months after the explosion you know, told us. He caught up with him, aren't you Tamra? Because you know, all his clothes are burned and skin hanging. And, but the shape of his head, he sort of kind of recognized it must be my cousin. And he said, yes. And so the two started to walk a little bit. My cousin was barely making it. Then the plane came back. And we all thought that they came to shoot, like in the other kinds of uh, attack. Hideko Tamara, you suffered radiation sickness. Can you describe what that was like? You're a child. Oh, yes, yes. I, I was caught up with my cousin's story. I'm sorry. I, I loved him so much that I just slowed down. I was covered with boils in August afterwards, and then suddenly I started to run very high fever off the chart, uh, hair falling, uh, stomach trouble, and I think I bordered life and death for uh, weeks, and then finally it came down. But followed with jaundice, my white of my uh, eyes were completely yellowed, and you could tell, even though you know Asian skin tends toward golden, I was totally yellow in a sort of much yellowish hue, and I was exhausted, like a, a liver trouble, you know, jaundiced. I had no energy to even walk around, and I would sit where I was with my relations, where we took refuge. I was not able to go to a, a school. I missed most of my school days uh, because of that. Um, it was in a sort of like a, a top of the mountain type of a place in a town called Kabe, quite a bit away from Hiroshima. And I noticed where I was 
you know, exhausted and ailing. Some of the people who had been in Hiroshima were dying with thyroid blowing up, high fever, and then bleeding from all orifices and having red spots all over. We didn't know, you know. It, we were even worried about mosquito bites if it was the start of the radiation sickness. We didn't have that word. We didn't know it was atom bomb related because only those people who barely survived, but not really. It was, it was like you, you were not well. People suddenly then died. Even those who came to look for their kins into the city had the similar kind of a reaction. Hideko Tamara Snyder, yeah. astoundingly, you would ultimately come to the United States to go to college, Bennett College in North Carolina, and you then got training as a psychiatric social worker. You live in Portland. It's 75 years ago today, as you have told your story to people, to students, to community groups. What message do you have for President Trump today, as many fear the beginning of a new nuclear arms race? Well, you know, I came to a conclusion, all survivors did, the people of Hiroshima now would like to issue message that this is a horrific bomb so harmful and inhumane that a human race cannot live with it. And we want to get that message out to everyone. And my way as a former clinical social worker is to encourage two former enemies, especially, to come closer in what I call collective healings, because there seems to be still anger tied up about the Pacific War against Japanese. And that means they're not healed either. And in our attempt to heal, we have to promote, don't let this happen to you. This is horrible. I chair One Sunny Day initiatives to do that, and I try to bring that which would encourage seeking solutions and seeking treaties and seeking collective approach to be able to live in peace in the world. However, if you are especially pointing me to speak something to President Trump, I would say the same thing, Mr. President. This is unallowable weapon on this earth. Please help us talk it out through treaties rather than intimidating, intimidating and pushing, because throughout the history, it's not the intimidator that will start the war and do unwise things. It's the intimidated that would study any of their chances. And if they thought there was nothing, they would strike back with everything possible. And should they have their hand in nuclear weapon, Please be prepared. It is a beginning of our end. Hideko Tamara Snyder, I want to thank you so much for being with us, survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The memoir recounting that moment is titled One Sunny Day, A Child's Memories of Hiroshima. She's a retired psychiatric social worker, founder of One Sunny Day Initiatives, peace education organization. She lives in Medford, Oregon. When we come back, we'll be joined by Greg Mitchell, 
author of many books on Hiroshima, including his latest The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Stay with us.